Well, hi folks. Today we are supposed to continue with what we have already started with. That is how far influential philosophy on the evolution and development of literary. We've already referred to the idea that we are not going to deal with it later. Rather, we are going to touch on certain focal points, beginning with the Plato's understanding of the creative process of how literature comes into being, and we have covered this. We've already said that uh, Plato was adopting the theory of in the sense that the poet could not produce one of the muses. In other words, he plays the role of a conveyor or a mediator. He conveys what he is inspired with. Audience, be they listeners or readers. Moreover, he is of the idea that the poet is a keyboard, is a midway position between the prophet on the one hand and the madman on the other. Along with this goes the idea that the language he speaks is some sort of a, a frenzy. This definitely has got its own repercussions in the sense that it's going to set him apart from his fellow citizens. Now we turn to another not less Important topic reasons for Plato's rejections of both poets. And I've already referred to the idea that, you know, rejection of negative attitude towards poetry, not to Plato's alone, rather, it is also associated with Douglas and uh, above all, Thomas Love Beatles in his book, The Four Ages of Poetry. The problem is not accessible to, to survey the ideas, or the basic ideas that have been articulated out by a of people. On the other hand, there are people who stand for poetry. And by standing for poetry, that is tried to, to defend not only the poet, but also poet. Beginning with, with Sydney, the 16th century, and his two essays, uh, essays in a defense of poetry and an apology of poetry. To further on the line, this could be recognized again in a defense of poetry which was published Percy Bushy. Apart from this, if of someone is Freudian, that uh, Freudian is an adjective derived from the famous psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. Someone is Freudian in his own orientation. Definitely, he will come across the idea that the human mind is an organ that, by its own nature, produces poetry. In other words. Poetry will never die, as Thomas Love Peacock claimed in that. So, to deal with the reasons for or causes behind Plato's rejection, use the following. Reasons that have been forwarded by Plato could be divided into ways. One is epistemological, derived from the term epistemology, the science that studies how we know what we know. Unfortunately, there is no room, nor is there a place for epistemology here. Of all, it, uh, it studies the relationship between thoughts and reality. Hence, 
it supplies in philosophy again. So one of the basic reasons for Plato's rejection of both poetry and poets is epistemology. The, the second one is they can recognize that these two pillars, um, uh, pillars in, in, in Plato's philosophical bulk are quite significant. We have already touched the idea or on the idea that reality to Plato consists in. We've got two verb, two phrasal verbs, of yetel and yetagel, to manifest itself, to express itself, to show itself, to play itself, and so on and so forth. If you are familiar with the word. A true reality consists in ideas. So the primary, primary, Point here is ideas, which is already dubbed, that is described by Plato as essences or ideas. True reality in, uh, in ideas of which individual things, that is to say, the things or the constituting actual reality is an imitation or a reflection. By the way, whenever we mention the word reflection, the idea of the mirror or the being mirrored, mirror, what is mirrored, comes in. And I have no time here to deal exclusively and meticulously with the role and function of mirror in human thinking. The theory of reflection, or actually imitation, begins with Plato, and it was developed in what is called theory. Marcus's philosophy, apart from the idea that you know it gets in or it fits into Lacanian psychology, analyst, other alim nafs, Renzi, he has introduced uh, the mirror stage. That is to say, in, in studying the evolution of the human being, there is a stage he labels as the mirror stage. So you can recognize that the mirror is. Uh, highly significant in human thinking, apart from the idea that we usually have two types of mirrors, the concave. Getting these two types of mirrors, definitely we may arrive at the painting, my summer, the elephant baby, which is spearheaded uh, by Pablo Picasso. I don't like to elaborate here, yeah, that's enough for, for the role and the function of mirror. If you would like to, to have more ideas, you can get access to certain books. Apart from the idea that there is a critical book, which was published in 1953 by a famous American critic, Abrams, M. H. Abrams, that the title The Mirror and the Lamb. So with the help of The Mirror and the Lamb, we can categorize two types of poetry, which you have already been introduced. Restoration poetry is exclusively de uh, uh, dependent on the idea of mirror. That is to say, the poet in writing his poem brings in what is out into his own. Different from restoration poetry, the romantic poetry works on the idea of the lamb. It emanates the feeble lower out of its it emanates light. So, in writing his his own lyric. Romantic poet definitely exteriorize, exteriorize what's in the interior by dissecting himself or his, herself. By dissecting him, dissecting himself or herself. You see, a layer after a layer. I don't like to, to go in detail because I, I presume, and I hope I am not wrong, that you have been introduced to the theories or the basic theories upon which restoration and the romantic poet of written or worked out their poems. There is a difference rather, you see, between Dryden and Pope and, and Wordsworth and the other Roman. This is as far as you know, the epistemological reason that 
lead plate to reject poetry and poets. So here, we can arrive at an idea that he is very primarily concerned with the nature of, of literature, its value, and the debate will go on. On the other hand, we have got the aesthetic. You remember that we, I have already referred to the idea or the definition of aesthetic, that is to say, a science that studies beautiful. And uh, unfortunately, here yeah, we don't have the under the title of aesthetics, although I repeat what I have already referred to, we deal with so many aspects, uh, aspects as and be it drama, and so on. The Plato, however, is of the idea that poetry appeals to a lower faculty, man's emotions. By appealing to, to emotions, definitely this might be a guide or lead the individual to disturb the stability of the society he lives in. It tells us that the Plato is very much concerned with the stability of the society. It appeals. He is ignoring the idea that, you know, by writing poetry, poetry gives form and shapes emotions. And this is, this is uh, some sort of a refutation that has been introduced by Aristotle, which are now uh, uh, ideas that we are going to deal with later on when we come to Aristotle. The, in, uh, the, the idea that poetic form shapes emotion is going to be adopted or taken out by a comparatively modern literary English critic by the name of I. A. Richards, the nor the time are fit, you know. For me, at least, to speak about Richards, is a man behind the idea of the psychological evaluation. And this ideas could be easily recognized in formative book under the title Principles of Literary Criticism, which was published in 1924. However, again, Plato has not rejected all poets. He has dealt out certain conditions for the poet to be accepted, approved of in his ideal republic. One, he should be of 50 years old. You see, by being of 50 years, definitely the human individual will be very much free from the audacity, irrationality. And that is to say, he has got the aptitude to control his own emotions. Moreover, he accepts the poet who has done noble deeds to this And hence, the, the close relationship in terms of platonic theory between literature and poetry. This is a very thorny tone, a very thorny topic. According to Napoleon, he says poetry, uh, or you see, power is everywhere. Power is everywhere. The idea that means, you see, a lot of effort. A lot of time to elaborate because it was a brother, that is to say, introduced by the French philosopher by the name of you can recognize that you know, even the composition among political parties is that you get an access to what is called discursive power of it's not a matter of 